As soon as you learn proof by induction, you move on to this formula. This is one of the first examples you uh, see, one of the first applications you get to do once you learn proof by induction. I will leave a link to a playlist on uh, induction videos in the description box. And after you apply induction to this and you prove it and you see, oh yeah, it's true, you get this feeling that you're not quite satisfied with the proof. And I will show you why and where this feeling comes from. Let me do a quick proof by induction of this thing. So I will call this statement PN, and I got to prove the first thing here, the base case, like usual, base case. So I'm going to prove P1, I have to establish that. All right, so I get uh, this when n equals one, and that's one, so base case is true. Now the induction step, assume Pn is true, and we're going to use this to prove, let's see if we can prove Pn plus one is true. So let me start by writing the uh, left-hand side with n plus one, that's equal to the following. Okay, so that's pretty obvious. It's just the sum of all the squares up to n plus the last one, n plus one squared. Now here I will apply the induction step, this one, and uh, okay, I can substitute that in there. And I get this, right. And with a little bit of algebra, and this is an exercise for you, you can show this, show, the, show this, show the following that this here is equal to the following, right? But this taken together, this part and this part taken together, that's the statement P n plus one. Okay, so we proved it. So we proved that P n implies P n plus one. We have our base case. And so therefore it's true for all natural numbers n. All right, so what's wrong with this proof? Well, there's nothing wrong with this proof. It's a good proof and it's perfectly valid and fine. However, uh, there's something that kind of makes us wonder, where did we get this idea in the first place? So let me write this down to emphasize this. Where did this come from? Induction proved it but it did not tell us how to derive this. So it sort of dropped on our lap and we didn't know if it was true or false, but with induction, we can establish that it's true. But where did this come from? How do you think of such a thing in the first place? Well, induction doesn't tell you. And this is one of the uh, sort of weaknesses of induction. It's a very powerful tool, but it has some limitations. And Sometimes it doesn't tell you where this true formula comes from that you're trying to prove. So in this video, we're going to um, actually do a constructive proof. I'm sure there are plenty of ways to prove that sum of squares formula, but I'm going to show you a way using the Leibniz rule. And, uh, you know, in the last uh, few videos ago, uh, I did a... a kind of an episode on the Leibniz derivative rule and some of fun application to something that looks like finite math. Well, here's another uh, finite math connection with the Leibniz rule. So I'm going to leave a link to that in the description box. Yes, Leibniz rule, the gift that keeps on giving. The starting point is the geometric sum formula, which we all know, but we can play with the exponents. So instead of n, I go up to n minus two. So this changes also. Great. And now let's multiply both sides of this here uh, by x squared. And while I'm at it, I will take this and bring it over to the left-hand side. Right, and this gave us kind of a nice formula where I have an n, you know, in this big sum on the left, it goes up to n, so that's nice. And so this is kind of like the starting point of all of our thinking. 
what we're going to do here is define two functions, one for the left and one for the right hand side. So f of x, that's our left hand side, f of x, and g of x, well, we'll, we'll call the right hand side g of x, so that's x n plus one minus x squared. Great. Now it's time to apply Leibniz rule. We want to find the third derivative of f. Well, f is a product of two functions, u and v. u is x minus 1, v is the big sum. And we can use Leibniz's generalized rule now. And Leibniz's generalized rule says this. It's kind of like the binomial theorem. All right, so some of these things are 0. u, OK, u prime is 1. But u prime prime, that's 0. And u prime prime prime, that's 0. So that simplifies things. Uh, this here goes away, and this goes away. So we are left with the task of computing this uh, second and third derivative here of v. Let me write down v neatly here so that I don't make any mistakes. Right, so v prime prime is pretty easy to evaluate. Second derivative of the first term is just 2 times 1, and then second two, two derivatives of this term, that's 3 times 2x, and then 4 times 3x squared, and so on and so on, dot, dot, dot. And the last one is n, n minus 1 times x to the power of n minus 2. That's very good. OK, just follow the same sort of recipe. You can start here. Uh, well, OK, you could just differentiate this one more time. This is going to go away completely, and we'll have a term here, 3 times 2. We'll begin with that. And just to be complete, I'll call it like this, 3 times 2 plus 1. 3 times 2 times 1. Next one is 4 times 3 times 2 times x, and so on and so on, all the way to the last one. n, n minus 1, n minus 2, x to the power of n minus 3. Very good. So now let's plug everything into our formula for the third derivative of f. OK, I got it. I got my first term here. That's this. And now we have to add the second term. That's 3 times u prime, but u prime is just 1. All right, now v prime prime, what's that? Well, we have computed it right here. And there we have it, right. Very good. So the third derivative evaluated at x equals 1, uh, that works out nice and neatly because this then becomes 0. And I'm left with the following, uh, just this stuff here. All right, but all of the x's are 1. So I can write this as 3 sum from k equals 1 to n, k, k minus 1. All right, let's put a nice star here because that's very important. Now, do you remember what g was? Let's compute the third derivative of g. g was this, x power n plus 1 minus x squared. And then g prime prime is very straightforward to compute. There we go. The uh, x squared term disappears. And of course, we want to see what happens at x equals 1. Right. So what happens at x equals 1? Well, we have n plus 1 times n times n minus 1. All right, so we put everything together. The left-hand side has to be equal to the right-hand side. So I get this equation and this gives us the following fascinating uh, identity, k equals 1 to n, k, k minus 1 mm, equals n plus 1, n, n minus 1. Very nice, very, very beautiful formula. We're almost finished. We just have to do a little bit of, a uh, little bit of algebra, a little bit of thinking, and we're almost done. OK. Here's that identity I just proved in the previous section. And I moved that 3 that used to be here, I moved it over to the other side. When I expand the left, I see here that if I could get rid of this 
term, then I would just have my sum of squares and I would be done. Well, that's, uh, I could just add something, right, to both sides. And I'm sure you know the sum of all the integers from 1 to n is just the triangular number n, n plus 1 over 2. So if I add n, n plus 1 over 2 to both sides, I'm good to go. And I did it right here. So I added this to both sides, but that's the same thing as adding the sum from k is 1 to n. And so this, this term here goes away, and I'm left with this. And as an exercise for you, you can finish the algebra. It's just a little bit of fun algebra to get my final answer, which is this beautiful formula here. And so now we have done it. We have figured out a constructive way to derive it. We now know one way of deriving this beautiful identity from first principles. And I'm sure there are many other similar identities that you can derive using these techniques. Why don't you look into that? All right. Well, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you really like this video, send me a super thanks. And I will see you next time with another episode of Interesting Mathematics. <laughs>